they told me to walk slower, but you know, it is what it is. Welcome everyone to Service Mesh Management at Scale. My name is Cole Morrison. I'm a developer advocate here at HashiCorp. That is, my focus is DevOps and infrastructure, but formally, it was software engineering. Actually, most of it was uh, software engineering, but uh, there was a question that, that drew me from that field into where I am now, and hopefully it'll vibe with all of you. That was, how can I make things scalable? Ah, yes, not a me, things meant software, okay? To be honest with you, I really just wanted the infrastructure, the processes, and especially the people and the users to get out of my way <laughs> so I could just write software and have it infinitely scale. And obviously that is uh, very narrow and fails to take into account the other things. Now I was doing what we do as humans, right? Thinking about uh, problems in my own context, but there's obviously other pieces. Our infrastructure runs our software, which our people then give to our users, but it's bi-directional. Our users have their needs, which influence our people, which create the software, which then has its infrastructure requirements. It's all connected. And the thing is, is if you're missing one of the pieces to this equation, then answering the question of how can I make things scalable is uh, pretty much impossible. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go leave software, find the answer to this question, then I'll come back, and here I am. But uh, what does this have to do with service management, service mesh management at scale? Well, service mesh and the management of it are critical pieces to scalability. Um, so I think my slides here kind of pushed out, but ah, here we go. Right, and uh, it's gonna help you no matter whether you are in engineering, ops, or any business domain connected helping an end user with software. So how are we gonna cover this? Well, first up, we're gonna take a look at a journey uh, that deploys cloud-based services going from zero to scale so we can get the full context of the scalability question. And after that, we're going to talk about what service mesh is and the communication problem it solves. Then we'll get into a technical overview uh, so that we have a, we're gonna walk through setting up a service mesh, specifically console, so that we all have a clear mental model of all the work involved. And of course, we'll get into a demo where we're gonna see this all in context of a multi-cloud, uh, multi-runtime infrastructure, and of course, how console can help with that. And then we'll end with uh, resources, people, and next steps. So, uh, how, do we even wind up with the need for service mesh? This, uh, this is always sort of an interesting conversation, right? Because you get two groups of people. One is like, well, I don't, I don't know why. The other may already be at that. Um, the reality is the utility of a service mesh is dependent upon the size and maturity of your organization. But no matter where you are in that journey, right, you're headed towards scale, right? Or all optimists here. And if that's the case, and it probably is, the relevance is absolute whether you're big, small, greenfield, or brownfield. So we're gonna walk through that journey that way no matter what stage you're at, you understand what's going on. So in the beginning here, very simple. Uh, small user group, small team, uh, one application, uh, small infrastructure, maybe even just one app. This isn't only all you need, it's probably the best fit for where you're at. The simplicity brings efficiency, uh, and it also matches your organization uh, and your team. Obviously, we're gonna add more users here, and in the early stages, at least, we're gonna have to meet these requirements, and that's usually just with vertical scale, right? Our infrastructure, our people, and our software, they're gonna get bigger, but we're gonna leave things largely unchanged in terms of uh, structure or in process. Uh, we keep the simplicity, but off in the distance, uh, we can see that bottlenecks are there. Eventually, the user base, uh, it's gonna grow even more, and there's gonna not only be more of them, but they're gonna need more uh, features that may be connected to different business domains. We've gotta respond, but how? Now, interestingly, on the people side of things, this usually, this usually happens the right way, maybe because the path is, is more uh, well known, and we'll take that team and we'll split it into smaller teams, uh, usually, well, hopefully by business domain, but also by function, depending upon the stage of your company. And then, out of sheer necessity, we'll scale the infrastructure. We have to, right? Because the servers can only get so big, we start recognizing the need for horizontal scale, but 
Y'all know which one is going to stay here stuck, right? It's going to be the software. It's going to stay as one monolith duplicated and load balanced across all your servers. And this is, right, the software engineer was like, oh, my goodness. Eventually, this inefficiency is going to become too much, right? Uh, just scaling one business domain of your application means you got to scale the whole thing. You want to scale up just that messaging part of your app? Too bad. Whole thing's got to get bigger. The whole thing's got to get bigger. That means all the infrastructure that supports the whole app's got to get bigger. Your team now, they're second guessing all the different changes they got to make because, well, they might step on someone else's toes here. And obviously, this affects our end user who is now getting things uh, a lot slower. Now, we have two paths here. Uh, one, well, some, some organizations get very good at uh, staying on this path and squeezing every little bit of performance out of it they can. And uh, others, right, they'll, they'll perhaps find a unique architecture that's very specific to their business. But the wide majority are going to take a, another path, one that's a, probably a bit more, not a bit more common, uh, is probably where you're headed, right? Eventually, a new business domain is added. Okay, let's just say that it's shipping. And uh, everyone looks around each other in the room and says, if we got to add one more thing to our current application, we're going to go insane. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a brand new infrastructure in it put our application and this way that the team the team working on it it's got more they've got an autonomous workflow that's also asynchronous we can scale it independently we're going to give it its own protocol so that the old application can make use of it and by the way if uh if we add new services well they'll be able to go ahead and start working with that so uh all of this starts working out so well that this becomes the model for all future functionality and this brings us to the first part of our answer to our original question of how to make things scalable. And that is with a service-oriented architecture. This is how you're going to make stuff scalability. And no matter what, uh, what type of organization you're in, you're likely headed towards this or something similar to it because it's Conway's Law where your infrastructure and your software start mirroring your organizational structure. Uh, now, um, this is where you stop thinking about your software as a single unit, and you start thinking of it like you do your organization, right? So on the organizational side, we have uh, different teams, business functions, and domains that all roll up into one end-user product. And from the software side, we instead have different application services, uh, business functions uh, and um, domains, business domains and functions that all roll up into one end user facing application. Okay, so here we go. Brilliant. This means I can just get back to writing software, right? Not quite. Uh, no matter how clean this diagram might look, the reality is that we've created a simple process for a scalable one. Uh, we've got more of everything now, and uh, what's the difficulty with an organization as it grows? That's going to be communication. So teams, teams, more teams across regions, cultures, generations. Communication is hard, and this is no different in the technology side of things. So let's just take a look at this. I want you to think, once you've got all of these services split out, how are you going to make them communicate with each other? Okay, Between one, it's not too bad, just HTTP endpoints, uh, firewalls, some networking rules. But as soon as you start adding more of them, you got to consider questions like, should all services be able to access all services? Um, and how are they going to reference each other? IP, load balancer, some crazy DNS scheme. What happens when they're across regions, across cloud providers? And you got to do this all across like hundreds of them. You see, we climb to the peak of this mountain trying to find the scalability answer. We're going to find the tip of, another, uh, of an iceberg that we already see on the people side of things, and that is communication, right? And so you want to know what Service Mesh solves? Just in case you're unaware, it solves all of these communication problems. It is the second part of the answer to our original question of how to make things scalable. So now we know the issues that a Service Mesh solves, but just to make sure we have all the right context, uh, let's Let's figure out exactly what a service mesh is. And for time's sake, we're going to just do it in an analogy here. So we've got people and houses uh, with gates. There's roads. They're all in a neighborhood. The people are your services. The houses are your servers. Gates are firewalls. Roads are the networking infrastructure. And they're all in a neighborhood. 
okay? And now you can think of that like sort of like a data center. How are you going to make it so that these, uh, the different people can communicate with each other? You're not allowed to say Slack or Zoom. That doesn't exist in this world. And if you want to say that, you're going to have to build that yourself, okay? We can do that, or we can use a tried and true model, and that's going to be service mesh or postal service. Postal service is the service mesh. If we do this, we have a standard method of communication that's secure, observable, and manageable, right? And no matter what type of person you are, what type of house you're in, uh, you just get and put your messages from a mailbox. And not only that, our postal service has a centralized a headquarters that can uh, manage all of this, right? They can uh, route, they decide how traffic gets routed or how communication gets routed. Uh, they can uh, decide who can talk to who. I don't know uh, if real postal service is doing that, but this is just for the analogy. <laughs> and they can handle uh, if things fail over. This gives us all the control that we need, right? And so this is what it is and what it does, really quick, into an analogy here. Um, but to draw some more technical lines, uh, just so you understand what's, what's, what's going on here, just think of the delivery people in the mailboxes as your data plane. They're the clients of your service mesh, and this postal service is going to be the control plane and the servers of your service mesh. Um, but to the more technical folks, obviously, we're going to say, this is great, but how do we get this all up and running? Uh, so let's just uh, walk through here and take a sort of a quick quick overview of what goes into setting up a service mesh uh, specifically for console. Uh, this way, for a couple things, this will give you a clear picture of what's going on, and it also set us up for the demo where some of this stuff will already be done. So first up, you've got your baseline requirements, some that aren't even on here, uh, which are deploying your apps. You know, console's not going to do that for you. You do have to do that. And part of that's going to be your networking. Well, console has certain networking requirements that you're going to have to set up around your ports, your firewalls, your routing rules. And uh, once you get all that set up, you're going to then create and deploy your console clusters. If we reference our analogy, again, those are the postal service headquarters. And they're going to coordinate all of the clients in the service mesh. When you have that up and done, you're going to set up access control uh, within a console. And this is going to follow a very familiar system of uh, creating tokens and then rule sets called policies. You attach them to the tokens. You give them to the different services nodes and humans. And this tells them if they can participate in the service mesh and to what extent. After this, we're going to then set up the clients for the uh, services. These, in our analogy, are the... Uh, they are the mailboxes and delivery people. And from a technical perspective, what happens uh, is that instead of services connecting and communicating directly, everything starts going through a proxy. Uh, this not only lets us forward and manage that traffic, but it also they also do so in console over mutual TLS, so you get encryption uh, for all of your communication. Now, if you're trying to do this across uh, clusters and data centers, uh, well, that's where you're going to set up peering, and we saw some of that earlier today, and mesh gateways. And you can think of these like VPNs, and they actually come uh, in console, so you don't have to go and find other tools to get that done for you. And once that's finished, we are ready to start uh, uh, to start managing the service mesh. Now, I want to stop here for just a second because I know uh, that that when you look at this, we're going to kind of have two audiences here. One are going to say, "Okay, um, this is this is way too easy. There's definitely more in this." You're right. There is. There's some stuff in between. Think of these like guideposts. But then there's the other side that's going to say, this is already too much, because I can already kind of draw the line and see if this is going to be quite a bit. But I want to make a point here. Y'all are going to be making a service mesh in one form or another. All the problems we've just talked about, all these communication problems, you're going to have to solve. You may not call it a service mesh, but you're going to be making it. And this is just getting it up and running. The reality is that a service mesh is a service itself. Okay, so that means you're going to have to put together the infrastructure uh, and, and the software and maintain it. And then there's all the stuff on top of that. Some of the things we've sort of touched on in terms of observing the communication, setting up fine grain auth, uh, checking the health. Right? You can, you're going to have to build all that. You may have a ton of scripts or whatever, but again, it is a service mesh. All right, so... This question here, right, there is one final part. It leads up to one final part of our answer to how to make things scalable. Because once you get your infrastructure and software and people aligned in a service-oriented architecture, you get connectivity and communication set up uh, 
do service mesh, you're going to have to deal with the management and the maintenance of all of it. And uh, this is where I want to hop into a scenario here so that we can set up a demo and see all this actually in action. Okay, so um, demo here, right? Uh, you've been following the journey of this company, and you're finally at a point where you've got isolated sandboxes for all your different teams. They're all on AWS, and perhaps they're using Elastic Container Service. Um, everything's going pretty well. You've home-baked your own custom communication, but the overhead's getting a bit much. So now you're looking uh, at a service mesh. But before you make that selection, you get called into an off the office by your boss. He tells you, hey, two other companies have been acquired, all right, and they have infrastructure and services that you need to set up with our own. Uh, you know, you've had conversations with them about keeping this uh, homogenous, but uh, regardless, you ask. So they're all up on AWS, right? Well, actually, one of them is on uh, Azure, and they're just running it directly in virtual machines. Okay, so we're going to be hooking those up. And what about the other company? Well, they're on Google Cloud Platform, and uh, we know how this goes. You don't even ask the runtime because you can already see in the horizon uh, the, the blur of Kubernetes swag stampeding in your direction. This is your scenario. Now your problem has grown even bigger. You've got this across three different cloud providers. And are you asking, can a service mesh help? Well, you know what session you're out of here, so you know what I'm going to say. Of course, and of course, we're going to say console can help that as well. So now we're going to hop into a demo and hopefully show my screen here. All right, cool. We can see this. So. We're looking at a foundational uh, project here that we're going to use for our demo. Uh, it represents both the scenario that we've talked about and also the patterns and practices in context of scalability. We're also on Terraform and Terraform Cloud here, so we can uh, version control all of this because obviously that's much uh, when we have it as code, uh, controlling the past, present, and future of all of it is much uh, much better than tickets or click ops. Um, this is probably going to raise some opinions here, but we have this structured in a monorepo as well, not a monolith, a monorepo. So this current branch represents the state of our production infrastructure at any given time. And uh, we've got different folders representing the different data centers. And within any of them, uh, we may have different sandboxes of infrastructure uh, being worked on by different teams. And because we've got this hooked up to Terraform Cloud, and I can already see that I've gotten logged out of our product here. So let's just uh, just just ignore this. <laughs> yes, yes, okay, good, good, good. But because we've got this hooked up to Terraform Cloud here, uh, for example, our client uh, our client service code here. Whenever this changes, it'll obviously go up, and no one else will be uh, will be bothered working on anything else. Obviously, I want to keep going on about Terraform Terraform Cloud, but I gotta I gotta move on here. So. Our scenario, this is what it, where we're headed. In AWS, Elastic Container Service, we have some services set up. On Google Kubernetes uh, Engine, we have uh, another three. And then directly in virtual machines on Microsoft Azure, we have those there. Um, they've gone ahead and set up their baseline requirements. What's missing is the connections between all of them. And so what we're going to do now is walk through those guideposts uh, that we went through and figure out how to get there. So the first thing was deploying a cluster, right? So there's two ways you can do this. You can either host your own and that'll be either, either open source or enterprise, or you can uh, use HashiCorp console if you want to let us manage the infrastructure for us. Now, we've actually done both. So you're going to get to see both sides of this. And so I'm in the HCP console console. It's kind of a tongue twister. The management plane here. And you can see we've got three clusters set up. And if you, uh, so we've all gone ahead and deployed those. But if you wanted to deploy your own, it's as simple as just clicking deploy console. And you can see those two options we talked about. Now, the nice part is if you do want to roll your own, you can, if you already have one, you can link an existing cluster, which is what we've already done for our Google Cloud Platform deployment. But Back over in here, these three clusters, uh, they all have their own console UI for those who haven't used this. So each cluster's got its own place that we can look at. And so if I hop over into this tab, we'll see that we've got the AWS's cluster uh, in here. And we can see four of the services live, as well as two others, the console service, this is just a helper, and then a mesh gateway, and we'll get to that. So 
You're looking at this, you're like, whoa, we, what happened to steps three and four, access control and service? Well, here's the thing. Uh, if you're on ECS or Kubernetes, uh, a lot of this is going to get handled for you. In ECS, we have modules you just plug into. In Kubernetes, you have our console Kubernetes tool and uh, some uh, Helm charts for you. And they'll just set this up with sensible, but with sensible defaults so that you can tweak those. But if you're doing it directly on virtual machines, yes, you are going to have to set these things up yourself. So uh, for access control, again, you're going to have to make some policies that have uh, permissions. And this is what these look like. It's just HCL. And then you're going to attach those to tokens and give those to your services and nodes. And that will tell them what it is that they can do within the service mesh. And as for services, well, you've probably already got those running on your virtual machines. And all you're going to do is install console write some configuration that tells console about those services, such as what port they're on and uh, the other information that they need. I know I zipped through that, but at this, in this code base here, uh, you can see examples for ECS and the AWS uh, side of things and Google Kubernetes engine and the GCP folder. And then uh, the most universal, low level and manual approach to virtual machines we've got here in Azure. And if you're looking to apply it to a different runtime, uh, you're going to have the opportunity uh, to find that in there. But um, that is going to take us up to the fifth step. And this is where we're going to spend a little bit more uh, time because this is going to be what takes us to that multi cloud, multi runtime uh, part of things. So, um, the first thing we need to do is, first up, let's hop over to the HCP console, is set it up so that these different clusters can connect with each other. And that's going to be through peering, which we saw some of that today. And we, interestingly, though, in our management plane over in the services tab, we can see that all of those services are live across our, uh, different, our, diff our different clusters, like the mesh gateways in AWS, our coffee catalog here is in GCP. But if we go to our user-facing application, and uh, just uh, cross our fingers that this all works. Well, it's not supposed to work right now. But um, we can see that the AWS services are there, right? And they're reaching up to each other. But they don't know what to do with the upstreams to these others. And by the way, the AWS team's gone ahead and uh, prepped their code to connect these upstreams. So we need to peer these two clusters. And we're going to start with Azure. And we're going to do this in HCP. You can configure this. Uh, in Terraform or through the API or the CLI, but we're going to start here. And I'm going to create a cluster peering connection, select AWS, select the default partition, and partitions, for those that don't know, uh, these are like clusters within clusters. So if you want to set up a uh, console cluster and then give people within that a like their own, but not make a new one, you're going to use partitions. We only have one, so we're going to stick with that. And then uh, GCP, we're going to also, we're actually, let's start with Azure. That'd be good. We'll start with Azure. We'll do the default partition, partition and click Create. So this will go ahead and start uh, peering those two clusters. But just because the clusters are connected, it doesn't mean that the services are available or that there's access to them. Right? So some more management tools here. Now I'm going to hop back over. We're going to do this in Terraform. And they have opted to write that configuration in this config file. And this is what it looks like in lines 34, 1 through 34. Now, I know this looks, if you haven't done Terraform, well, everyone here's done Terraform. But if you haven't seen HCL before, uh, this, is, this is what's going to be doing it. And if you haven't, it, like, just imagine the bash script that you would be looking at to do all of this if we didn't have this. But we're going to make this really simple. What this is saying is that in this default partition, Right in Azure, and we saw ourselves select that. We're going to export the services to catalog, customers, and shipping. To who? Well, to a peer cluster that exists in a particular data center and partition. And once these variables uh, get pulled in, it's going to map to AWS and the default partition. Right? Simple enough. And we're going to do the same thing for GCP. This is going to make those services available. And so we don't have to export all of them, but we're going to export a few. Now, just because we've done that, though, doesn't mean they're accessible. This is the, one of the next tools, and that's going to be with service intentions. And service intentions are how we control access, uh, but layer 4 and layer 7 access. And let's just go down here and look at what one of those looks like. So we've written one for our shipping service that exists on Azure. Now, all this is saying here is that, hey, for our shipping service, allow access from our order service in the AWS data center on the default partition. Pretty simple. And so the sum total of that is that, yes, the shipping service is available, but only this order service 
uh, in AWS default, we'll be able to access it. And then we do the same thing for T catalog and T customers. And what we're going to do now is run our favorite process ever in Terraform plan and apply through uh, Terraform Cloud. And it's going to go up, change just this infrastructure, and everyone in AWS, GCP, and these other nested sandboxes uh, won't be affected. Now, we hop over here. We will see that these services are now live. Wonderful. Now let's go see if they actually made their way to the application. And shall we see it? Aha. All right. So we see that now the upstreams to Azure uh, and uh, the, the different upstreams are live. So let's do this again real quick with GCP, just so we can uh, put it in here and get it done. So we're going to create another cluster peering connection, AWS, default partition, GCP, default, and create. So that, we know it's coming next. And that is going to be to set up to export the services and do the service intentions. Uh, this team's opted to put it in a, in, in a sandbox of its own where they're just managing console stuff. And in the exported services files where they've chosen to do this, I mean, obviously that's what they named it. Same thing, in the default partition in GCP, export the services, coffee catalog, customers, and loyalty to the AWS data center in the default partition. Great. Then they're going to do the intentions. Same thing here, right? We're going to allow, so this loyalty service, we're going to allow access from our client service on the AWS default partition. And they've added some other things here to control precedence. We're going to run this through Terraform. Well, we're going to push it up to Git and then run it through Terraform. And uh, when we hop back over into services, look at that. We can see the coffee catalog, customers, and loyalty service all there. And let's cross our fingers and hope live demoing goes well and see if this makes its way. Don't fail me now. Come on. Uh, come on. Is it going to go? Yeah. yeah this, 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 oh, okay, so it's getting there. It's getting there. All right, so there's some of them. Come on. Come on. We got to roll this dice over, over public Wi-Fi. Let's get this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> by the way, why, just to fill time here, this is fake service, and this is not a real service, but it's a neat tool uh, written by one of our DAs, uh, Nick Jackson, that I'm using and uh, we're uh, hoping comes back up here. Um, <laughs> okay. Come on, service. You can do it. You can do it. I know you can. <laughs> Some of them are working. Okay. All right. I didn't. I didn't plan for this not to just happen instantly. So this is just one of those one of those things here. We could try to debug it live, I guess. But uh, I've only got two minutes, so we're gonna hope here that this goes ahead and works. Okay. So now one of the other ones has decided that it is that it is not doing it right. Okay. By the way, this is of no fault of of console. I think this is just my crappy uh, code, which. Uh, as we've said, I've been been a little bit out of software engineering, but um, yeah, what is this like? Tenth times a charm. <laughs> um, all right, all right. So the other one is still not liking me. Um, that's going to make almost everything else I say here sound a little a little off, isn't it? Um, so we're going to keep we're going to keep refreshing, but we're going to go ahead and uh, and move on and hope that as I continue forward that it goes. So the thing here is, despite the fact that we're continuing to see red here, and I would have hoped that we would have picked a, a better color uh, for all of this, this is still going to give us what we've been looking for in terms of... There! All right! Okay, look at them. They're all up. Okay. <laughs> yes! Sometimes the interwebs does not like me. Actually, I'd say like most times. There we go. We've got our diagram, right? Uh, this is what we were headed towards, this is what we've got, and this is the scale that we've been looking for. Because I know the UI here is obviously not all that, you know, it's not the, the greatest looking thing in the world. And, uh, uh, but I want to drive it home, right? If we need to scale that catalog service, we can do that without affecting anyone else. You want to add a new service, fine. Give them a new sandbox, hook it up. What if we want to make a brand new client application? Great. Just make a new one, hook it up to the new services, and let the old one stay there until it's fine. And what if Kareem, the builder who loves writing recursive functions that are all named one letter and take parameters with one letter, wants to make his own service? Fine. 
Put him in his own sandbox. He's not going to affect anybody else. This is the answer that we've been trying to make our way towards, right? So let me hop back over to the slides here. I don't know if, do I do that? Or does someone else do that? Yeah, yeah. I think they do it. Aha, aha, here we go. All right, so this, just to speed us along here, this, this is what we've been looking for. With this answer, which is what that was, uh, we now have uh, a, a way to handle scaling for our services and our teams. We have focused code bases and faster iteration for our software. And for our people, they can work asynchronously and autonomously. And of course, this is all good news for our users. So how to, well, looks like I missed the slide. It's okay. This has been full of, of mishaps so far. So y'all are used to it here, right? Um, making things scalable. Okay, as your company grows, this is going to become a need. You're going to need to make things scalable. And for the vast majority of you, you're going to wind up on a service-oriented architecture closely aligned with your organizational structure. It's Conway's law, okay? And your people, just as they need a layer of communication, connectivity, so will your software, right? Your software is going to need this as well. And uh, service mesh is going to become that next step. And after you've got the service mesh up, you're going to have to manage all of it. And of course, console was the option that was made for this at a multi-runtime, multi-cloud uh, scale. So I'm totally out of time here, and it's blinking right at me. So let's go ahead and get through this next part, which are resources and people that can help you with your next steps, though there are many of us. If you want to talk to some people, uh, we've got Rosemary and Nick up here who know practically everything in terms of HashiCorp products. Luke Kaiso is one of our principal console engineers who's got a book on getting up and running with console. Uh, Blake is one of our hyper-technical hyper product managers that can dive deep. And Van, who you saw in the keynote, obviously knows everything that's going on with console. And if none of those checked boxes, uh, hit up Kyle Ruddy and he can find who. Next and finally here, uh, check out that foundational project. Uh, I was going to explain what it is, but you saw what it is. It's got all of those different things, and we hope that can be a, a starting point as well as an educational reference. And I can't thank Rosemary and Nick enough for all the help that they, uh, they put into that, making that happen. And of course, check out Console, HTTP Console, and Console Enterprise. Uh, you're all headed towards scale. You may as well get to know the tools that are going to help you. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much.